Hello and welcome to the Dragon's Lair, the home of Old Georgians Hockey Club here at St George's College in Weybridge, Surrey, for the visit of the University of Exeter. I'm Simon Mason, I'm delighted to be part of the streaming project commissioned by the club and brought to you by Galvanised Media. Both teams come into the match having played three games in the first part of this split season. The pre-Christmas period sees everyone play everyone once with the league splitting in two after the festive break and the top and bottom halves playing for the spoils of league titles and European places and the bottom half for their survival in the Premier League. Old Georgians come into this game off the back of a loss, win and draw. The win at home a resounding 8-0 versus Durham and so that's the form they'll hope to replicate against the student side today. For the University of Exeter it's been three straight losses so far. The most painful probably last week against Premier League new boys Oxted against whom they'd probably have expected to take the points. Past form suggests that Georgians will have the history to come out on top, but Exeter do have a longer Premier League status and that could be vital. We managed to catch up with them during the course of this week to hear their thoughts on their pre-season and their season so far. Pre-season was good. Um, tough with injuries, like the, the, the boys uh, the conditioning level of the boys because of COVID hasn't, hasn't been hasn't been good, um, so we knew uh, they, the boys had some injuries. But actually, results went really well. We were we're blessed with amazing forwards, um, and bringing Griffin definitely gives us that little uh, a slightly a deeper option. Um, a, a guy that has you know, unbelievable hands as well. Um, first couple of times we saw him play, we just couldn't get over how, how good his hands were and what he was doing. Um, so he was superb. Um, Great to bring Jimmy Carson back in, worked with him a few years ago. Good addition to the squad, desperate to learn, uh, desperate to, to work hard and obviously do well with his Wales stuff. Um, and Nick Page, so he's been a great addition as well. So all, all good guys. Pre-season this year has been long. Uh, I think Mike's deliberately done that, but then it's been fantastic, kind of the mental health, the cohesion of the team. It's been something that with what we've gone through, getting sport back is such a crucial thing. First few games, semi-mixed bag, but we can see what we're trying and we feel unlucky that we're, we've kind of not come away with maximum points, but we can definitely see the opportunities. Um, and Mike's setting us up in a way that plays to our strengths. Yeah, it's been a strange pre-season, what with everything going on in the world, and I'm sure everyone's in exactly the same boat. But I think we've had a, had a pretty good shot at it. Um, I'd say our first few league games haven't gone perfectly, and I would also say that our, our general hockey play we, we probably haven't been quite rewarded with exactly the amount of points we should have, but that's, that's sport. If we don't put the ball in the back of the net as many times as we should do in a game, we're not going to get the points we should do. Um, so on the flip side, I could say we deserve the exact amount of points that we've got because we haven't been as clinical as we should. So hopefully... Um, but I think getting that EHL spot, we were really disappointed not to play playoffs last year. I think as a group, we felt... We felt we were in a great I think it's obviously been difficult for everyone with the, the restrictions of, of COVID and having to deal with that. But I think we've come together really well as a group and, you know, managed the situations as, they, as they've been. And, you know, we've got a brilliant management team here have done really well to put together a programme that has put us in a, a brilliant position um, to compete in this league. Um, some really tough opposition in pre-season and we we're really happy with how some of the results went. Um, but more importantly, performances were five or six weeks and um, so the joys of commentating are, are with me for a few more weeks now well let's hope this one goes well then if there's any inconsistencies between what we're talking about and the vts that you see with this this show building up and trying to start it from pitch side here at the, the dragon's lair sometimes there's a little bit of a delay so we don't necessarily see the pictures so if our comments don't quite match up with them please bear with us for now but that Old Georgia start has been mixed. Is there anything that you'd pick out at this moment in time that you've seen that you think they need to focus on today? I, I think going forwards, we've been excellent in creating chances. I think we can be a lot more clinical uh, in front of goal. Um, we were very good against Durham, um, but there have been a few missed opportunities. Um, and again, corners, we've really good at creating opportunities. Um, but again, being a bit more clinical in front of goal. Well, that's some things I need to work on. Let's see some of the highlights from the season so far for, for Georgians. I think we've got some images to show you. Welcome finished one place and 11 points behind old Georgians last year. So this would be a good test to see where both sides started the campaign. Holcomb's top scorer from last year, Nick Bandrak, opened the scoring in the fifth minute and then doubled the lead with another straight strike in the 16th. 
penalty stroke was awarded for a foul on James Tyndall as he was in the act of shooting early in the second half. And no surprise, Ashley Jackson stepped up to score high to the keeper's right. Sam Ward then smashed in the rebound to level up the scores. It was all headed for a draw until the final play of the game with Bandarak stepping up to claim an opening day hit. The University of Durham's first match in the Premier Division was at Old Georgians. James Carson fired the home side ahead in the 10th minute with Tom Carson doubling the advantage in the 24th. James Carson then added a third shortly before half time. The home side ran away with it after the break season before Sam Ward scored the first goal of what would become a hat trick by the 64th minute. After that, there was still time for James Carson to add his third and Old Georgian's eighth. Josh Kelly levelled it up early in the second half and there were no further goals, so this match ended 1-1. So some fabulous play so far from Georgians this season. That play set up the league tables as we see them. Georgians sitting in fifth at this moment in time. We can see that, that one win, one loss and one draw. University of Exeter, however, very near the bottom of the table. What will concern the University of Exeter is goals conceded versus goals scored. It reflects their historical position. Yes, they've been in this league for longer. However, unfortunately, they concede on average twice as many as they actually score. Georgians goals over time, 74-4 against 44 against. So they basically flip that the other way around. Far higher scoring than the University of Exeter. So they're going to have to get their defensive lineup sorted out if they're going to cope with performing today. Griff, looking at this as we come into it, yes, University of Exeter have been in the league for longer. Old Georgians' aspirations, they've come up. They now want to dominate in English hockey, basically, having spoken to a few members around the club, that's, that's the idea, EHL, and further winning titles. What do you think we're going to see this afternoon? Yeah, great question. I think um, having been part of a Loughborough University side, you kind of know what they're going to expect to, to, to kind of do. Um, they're going to be very fit, work hard, um, extremely hard. It'll be interesting to see if they set up man-to-man -man or zone um, to try and use that fitness against um, old Georgians. Um, so I think they're going to be very well organised, having spent a lot of time together, um, and I think they'll be extremely fit. And let's see, let's see what they can do on the ball. And as the teams just start to get themselves into those final huddles, sort of players that we might be looking for on, other, on either side who could create problems for each other? Well, I, I think you've got to look at the old Georgian side and, and pick out a few key players. Um, so obviously Ashley Jackson, England and Great Britain's all-time leading goal scorer. Um, he'll, he'll pose, pose a few threats. Um, Olympians such as Dan Shingles uh, and then right half, particularly um, James Albury has been causing carnage this season so far, uh, as well as Tyndall scoring a nice finish last week. So, um, yeah, it should be, should be a good game. Well, for the University, Duncan Scott's been highlighted as one of their absolute key players that they'll be looking to just to control things and keep a lid on it, understanding that they want to just dominate or dictate the passage of play. Speaking to them before the game, they're delighted to claim that actually six of the old Georgian players today have come from the University of Exeter. So they're a proving ground, if they like. They've got a fabulous program in their minds that develops players capable of then going on, if that's the case, to playing for the top clubs in the country. We are just moments away from that pushback. University of Exeter and Old Georgians substitutes away back to their benches. Umpires for today, Aidy Green and Nick Paget will be taking control of this match. The early exchanges and their part in them vital just to make sure they set the lines so both sets of players understand what can and cannot happen. I'm sure both teams will come out trying to just impose themselves, trying to take free hits quickly, trying to make sure that they control and dictate the pace of the game. Both sides ready to go. About 30 seconds before pushback. What do you think the pace of the game will be, Griff? Here we go, taking it early. Yeah, again, as I said, I think extra man-to-man -man, that tends to speed up the game. Um, if, if teams sit at zone, it, it can be a little bit slower. Um, 
but as, as a team we try to um, to kind of use the zone to really inject pace into the game when we win the ball and counter-attack. Well, there was that counter-attack turned over. Shingles with high pressure. In the end, Jackson stepping forward. That's an easy intercept. A bit fortunate for the University of Exeter. Messam taking it down with some pace down the right-hand side. Chased back by Page. Great ball across the park. Real pace. Slap ball in first time. Jackson back. Had to get the first touch. Shoulder to shoulder out in that far corner. Carson just putting the tackle in. And Tom Carson just going overhead, trying to find that lead run. University of Exeter still sitting with that back four, Chris. Being forced to drive that forward. Is that a tactic that Georgians are going to try and lure someone into carrying the ball forward? Yeah, so I think quite often teams either tend to step really high to, to, to press or drop off. And that is, as you said, to, to kind of lure teams into kind of full sense of security. I think you've got more time on the ball than you actually do. Um, as you just seen there by Exeter, really sort of allowing it into that pocket and stepping in and pressing. Georgians by comparison at the back three. Sanford coming forward, sees the overhead pass. That will get blown for being contested space. Next to favouring this right-hand side. Good driving run down there. Pulled inside, getting towards the edge of the circle. Lovely little dink into the D. Badger, however, arm outstretched. That's a Georgians free hit. But beautiful cut inside towards the top of the circle. Yeah, great skill. And as, as you said, um, extra really look at it today. Um, started the game well and I think um, definitely trying to right their wrongs from the last uh, three games of the season. So set up for a cracker today. Shingles on that fast, finds Carson in the circle. Carson just rolling around, on his forehand, goes back out for the shot. Seager Green somehow that bobbles between his pads, getting those kickers together just enough to take the pace off it. I think it went through the University of Exeter goalkeeper. Yeah, it'd be interesting to check the VAR on that. I think that rolled directly along the line, so uh, almost close to going in. Atkins finds a crossfield pass to Cunningham. Cunningham just looking forward. Good set up in the post, but great step in front by the University of Exeter. Good movement through those lines. Duncan Scott with that head protector on. Samford, though, reads the pass directly into the circle. I think we've seen early on in this game both teams sort of setting up at um, half court and then zonal. So it could be a really, really high paced counter attacking game. And whoever takes their counter attacking opportunities well. Well, Samford created that opportunity with a fabulous run all the way from back to front. In the end, it's Tyndall who goes onto his back foot to smash it past Seeger Green's left hand upright. But that's a 70 yard supporting run from Stanford, causing all sorts of trouble because he just wasn't tracked. I can hear the coach for Exeter University saying, secure it, secure it. It just felt like that was a high risk, but as they come forward, they've got away with it. Jackson comes out with the ball. For the University of Exeter, they just need to be careful as they drive into that pocket. It seems like they're inviting that turnover. Yeah, and as I said, that's kind of the, the plan of Old Jeans is to, to kind of think that you've got time on the ball. Um, and then as soon as you receive it in a pocket, bang, that's when you get two or three players around you. And as you said, he's trying to stay secure, which obviously wanting him to, to kind of keep it in that pocket or shift it quickly. Georgian certainly looking for quick early free hits, getting the ball away on turnovers. Looking for direct passes, both Tyndall and Carson happy to stay high to provide those points to distribute to. University of Exeter just calming things down a little bit. Finally they get out from left to right. Three pass transfer though. Does enable Tyndall to get across and he gets a stick on the ball. Shingles inside him. Shingles can get his eyes up. Passes into the circle. Play breaks down. Luke Brown getting back into the middle of play. First rotations just to the 
right hand side of our commentary position the intensity in these first five minutes has been of international standard simple running it's a lovely little turn and ball popped in field getting the free hit off cunningham yeah i think we, we could see quite a lot of subs today with the pace of the game so far well, the first five or six minutes have been brutal it's been up and back and just Sanford's run if you're doing 60 70 yard shuttles up and down it's going to be tiring yeah I, th I think this is where we need to um take control of the game at either side and um, because if it ends up like this you'd like to think the university side can scott gets a chance in wins the first corner it's an ugly chase tackle from tindley just reaching round and it's just that 50 50 if it's not absolutely clean all of a sudden it's going to cause a problem Tindall's still trying to make his point, however the decision has been given. Obviously no video referrals in the Premier League, we talked about VAR earlier on. Certainly I think our system is better than the football one, I have to say. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so just the delay on this first corner, the team getting their protective equipment out from the bag so they can get it on. Everybody with the masks and the gloves, it wouldn't surprise me if Sanford's running one, he does it internationally. like a double castle lineup at the moment affects the angles of the runners yeah so tend to send one runner um, and he'll just adjust really quickly to, to whichever castle it's going to so Pinner with some final words behind that Georgian's defensive line dictating where he wants his runners to go he'll have two or three defensive setups that he can call University of Exeter double castle at the top wide right supported on the left out hard, stop clean, in, long drag, takes touch off Samford, but the University of Exeter has still got the ball under control in the circle, and they win the re-award. Yeah, great running from Samford, that's that's time and time again he does that for, for club and country, and that's shown why he's uh, number one. It's such a brave line to run as well, it takes a, a certain mentality to get that tight and that close. I mean, he's had in horrible injuries from it with bones in feet and lower legs and all sorts of things that take him out of the game at times. He still continues to do so. Yeah, I think that's kind of testament to the character he is. As you said, some nasty injuries, but he's willing to do it time and time again. Georgian's defence set. University of Exeter's attack. Same castle, stop clean, wasn't quite as straight. Pinner with a big left leg through. Across with that left pad, safe clearance. George's defence reset. Makes to just get players back into the right positions. Carson denying that easy outlet. Next to do manage to get their great slap ball in with some disguise, but stepped up from behind by Cunningham. Strong reaching one hand tackle. And Atkins resets. Yeah, I think long corners could be a, a big part of the game today. Obviously, it's a great opportunity to kind of inject pace into the game. As you, as you saw there, very well done by Exeter, getting the ball deep into the circle early on. It looked like Carson was trying to deny that ball back, but if you go out to that wide space, then obviously you deny it. That's a great takedown from the overhead. Driving in, cuts in field onto the backhand. Seager Green with a left foot save. Out to the top play, back in by Carson. There's Georgian's first penalty corner of the afternoon, but what a fabulous takedown from the overhead. Yeah, and that's the kind of the, the threat and uh, skill that I said earlier about James Albury, and that's, that's what he brings to the game. Fantastic bit of skill to get in there, and a, a well-executed shot and a great save. Albury trotting out, the man who took down that overhead pass, trotting out to get to the injection. We've got Shingles stopping for Carson. Tyndall, first slip, just jogging out to knock the ball away. Jackson with a stop from Tother Carson. Two very different flicking styles for Georgians, but both very effective. Carson with a longer drag, charge down, somehow the ball stays alive. Aubrey tries to get that between his feet, past Seager Green, it stopped on the line with what looked like a foot, but the whistle had already gone. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure what happened there. I don't think it hit a foot, but probably bone for dangerous. That'll be an extra ball. Good advantage from Nick Padgett. Carson had just gone in on Duncan Scott's space. Duncan Scott finds the ball around to the outside. Ball played back inside. First time slap in and Pinner lets it go. The supporting run into the middle of the goal from Jack Knight just needed a touch. Yeah, I think Exeter are looking really, really dangerous going forward. So, as I said earlier on, if we uh, if we can keep it tight defensively, it should be a really good game as, we, as we're watching so far. Hey, you can. Right, 11 minutes through this first quarter of four. If we have got any hockey newbies joining us today, four 15-minute quarters replicating the international game. Teams will get a brief break between quarters one and two and quarters three and four. Sanford's pass, arrives. Scott reads it, picks it up. They go forward straight away. University Exeter, good long leads out in front, stretching play out to the right-hand side for Evans Evans. That is right, I checked that before. <laughs> the cliche is so good they named him twice, isn't that what has been said before? Paul played in, little touch. And it will be that long corner that you talked about earlier on, Griff. Yeah, I think with these long corners, you either tend to, tend to try and go quickly to kind of catch the defence off, but as you just saw there with Exeter, just sort of taking their time, making sure they've really got a good structure before they play. Do you find if teams don't really focus on process and outcome, in games like this you can actually get into overspeed, it becomes too quick because each side is challenging each other physically and then you feel that the only way of combating that is to be even quicker, so sometimes it just gets a little out of control. Yeah, definitely. I think with the, with the pace of hockey, you can easily get caught up in that. So trying to trying to inject pace when you can to try and catch the defence off guard. But as you said, you can get caught up in that. So recognising phases of play and when you actually need to slow the game down. It's a slap ball in. Takes a little touch. Tigreen thought about coming forwards. Here, Georgian's long corner. Jackson comes up. Yeah, that's a good example there, Jackson just taking that really quick pass to Shingles to try and catch the defence off guard. That's a great tackle from Scott again. Jackson trying to just fake that right foot, pulling across left foot, but doubled up on the skill, did the same thing twice. Great one pass transfer all the way around next to finding some space. Just getting down now, Atkins stepping forward, really good intercept as he steps through. He's cutting forward. Oh, I get away with that. I have to say, I thought the first one was going to be given the other way. Orby comes forward, looks for the overhead. There is a stretch of play, Carsten deep on the baseline. He's complaining because he felt the defender had impeded him. However, I do like the interpretation of that from Greenwood. I just, it's when he gets into put players, put their hands on going five, and you all, actually, that's just bad skill. Yeah, with a new rule coming in as well, allowing intercepts as long as you're not sort of going backwards, it's uh, it, it can be quite tough. But I think, as you said, you just you just got to be a bit skillful and just try and pick them. That's all we want to see. You just want to see. Well, rather, what I I don't like seeing is just kind of going. This this it's five. It's five. When I miss that first touch, you, go, you know what? You were in space. Take it down. If it's three or four at this level, an international level, take it down. Play on. Get on with it. It's not dangerous. Here we go, though. George around the right-hand side, looking for the ball into the circle, deep into that bottom corner, and plays it across. Sega Green with a safe right foot clearance. Exeter pinned in back to the direction they want to go. Carson trying to get a stick in there. It's going to be a free hit somewhere. Shingles, eyes up. I don't think that went five, but it was allowed. Yeah, I watched um, a bit of the uh, Exeter Hampstead game, and Exeter did look a little bit suspect. Um, during long corners, but it looks like last they've really played into the season and they've um, they've tightened the massively defensively. And they're looking in good shape. That's a great overlapping run. Shame about the first touch. It does take a foot, however. Jimmy, when you can. Get it away. Jimmy, yeah, we, we didn't get a chance to see the VT, but for the, for the pre-season reflections, for me as a student side, really difficult because you're not going to get your team together until probably three or four weeks, and particularly with COVID, maybe some even more sort of impact of that. Whereas George has had that six-game 
pre-season and had that long development spell, both with fitness programs and technical programs. So harder for the university to get up to speed right at the start of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, as you said, having watched back a few a few bits of their, their game so far, they... Segi Green comes out, so not a good clearance of the stick, just about gets it away far enough to allow them to defensively carry it clear. Step forward, solid, strong tackle from Fleet. Making ground support from Tyndall. Tyndall, I'm sure, try and get his feet round and bring other players into it. Wins the, I was going to say, wins the free hit, but had you decided it was hand. So sorry, you were saying before we break down for that, that forward play about the, how difficult it is for the university to possibly get up to speed right at the start of the season. Yeah, uh, exactly that. Tough to get into the start of the season, particularly during lockdown, uh, having not seen each other for a while. But last few games, they've, they've really picked up and they're, they're looking a good unit. So back three now for Exeter. They've rolled their right half up and infield to try and support through midfield. Great little turn. Shingles exposed. Ball carried straight down the middle. Little left to right. There's a foot in there somewhere. Stick obstruction blown. And good immediate early counter. Shingles yet again on the ball through the midfield channels. Finds a beautiful hit pass out to the left-hand side. In for Carson. Carson just trying to get the ball clear. Surrounded and swarmed by three white shirts. Yeah, great counter-attack. Trying to go quickly there. It's really, really good to see. Atkins dinking field. Goes to the push pass in. Gets a touch from Tyndall. Stepping in front of his defender. The faintest of touches. AD Green absolutely certain that it had been touched. A hard push pass in from Atkins. Seeming to penetrate straight through the heart of defence. Yeah, I think in, in those sort of situations, the route one, trying to get the ball deep into the circle early, something that a lot of teams try to do, um, which we've done well there. And as a forward, the discipline to just hold really deep until you get either that visual or physical connection and then step in front at the last minute, just the defender doesn't know where you are. Yeah, spot on. So I think a lot of players um, playing in the forward position tend to feel like they have to run around the D a lot. Um, but as you saw there, the sort of um, experience of Tyndall there just to sort of hold as you said and then dive in last minute just to get in front of his defender. Well, it's the faintest of touches. We didn't hear a touch from over here but umpire Green right on the spot gave it straight away and there was no defensive uh, objections. Now they get down towards the end of this quarter. For anybody who's watching, I'm wondering whether the umpires will blow it because I've got 18 minutes on my watch. <laughs> there we go. There's an extended first quarter. I'm fairly certain on, on social media somebody will will tell us whether they're. I'm fairly certain it's 15 minute quarters, not 17 and a half. Yeah, it's international 15. I think they've uh, taken a, a leaf out of the uh, European Hockey League and gone for the 17 and a half quarters. <laughs> Hey ho, it went past in a flash anyway. Um, but I think, unfortunately, that draws to a close. Your first quarter, are we, are we handing over? Is somebody new coming in? I think passing over to the, uh, the trusty Northerner, Andy Ball. So uh, hopefully see you later in the game. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for inside the first quarter. Brilliant. Thanks, Rich. So the teams go back into their huddles. Some words. High-paced first quarter. Old Georgians with that Tyndall goal, just a little touch in from the Atkins pass. Gives them that 1-0 that lead, but Extra will be happy with how they've set up so far. They've injected some pace themselves, they haven't sat back and invited pressure. So just a few words, possibly thinking about going from that back four to a back three, enabling them to get more players into midfield. But delighted to the handover. Chris Griffiths has stepped out. Andy Ball stepped in. 19 caps for Scotland. Your second season at OGs. What do you think of what you've seen so far? Yeah, I think it's been a pretty good game so far. I think we've got to give you know a bit of credit to Exeter where it's due. You know, they've they've come out, they've had a game plan to start with and they've stuck to it and definitely caused uh, OGs a, a few problems, that's for sure. So um yeah, I don't think there's much give between the two teams at the minute, but whether that will change with the, the break, you know, it's always Nice to have that sort of quarter time when you can put a few wrongs right and, and, and come out flying from the start of the, the second quarter. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. 
Anything glaring that you've seen from either side, but George, you know them better, obviously, that you think they should look at or focus on? I think in those pockets, just in the midfield there, that's where we're sort of looking to try and try and win the ball from uh, a couple of screens. Um, like I said, the Exeter boys have done well in there. They've, they've turned and they've, they've managed to play forward, and that's something that we're, we're trying to negate. So I think if we get a bit more of a, a bit more pressure on those players in there, we'll be uh, looking to attack forwards and, yeah, get a good few wins from that. Well, let's see how that pans out. So 1-0 to Old Georgians at the start of the second quarter. Exeter University playing with a fairly regimented back four from left to right in front of us in that white strip with the green socks. Georgians maroon shirts and shorts as Jackson just takes that backhand crash ball across on the middle of his calf. He'll try and jog that off. He's put a hand up to say that he wants to be substituted. talking earlier on about um, with Chris about his hero of Grealish and I think Jackson if you want to pick somebody out up there the little short shin pads the socks that, <laughs> that long way down if we, put, if we put a little headband on him we'd be getting somewhere close I don't know I think you've got to question who our Mason Mountain is then really don't you if you're talking about Grealish but <laughs> Carsten picks up Peels rolls in field needs to get the ball away it's good strong defensive tackling from Jake Payton in the end Driving forward, staying on his feet. Exeter, a bit of space down that left-hand side. Good cut in field. Sanford, one-handed tackle. Scott, so far for Exeter, seems to be able to create a reasonable amount of space for himself. And would, if you're in that sort of game situation, would Georgians or a team look to be putting more pressure on specific playmakers or keeping the shape and structure that they would normally play to? I think we've got to keep that shape and structure. I think we know we, we understand those players that they're in there, the, their strengths and you know how we try and sort of take those strengths away from them. But I think if we get too focused on those individual players, it can sort of detract from the, the team shape. And I'd like say that team shape is what's really important for us at the minute. Shingles chasing back, just plays the ball back away to Atkins. Atkins looking for the first time ball for Tyndall. Tyndall with a wry smile, suggesting that he's possibly not that quick anymore. <laughs> Would have taken a full out sprint from a player probably 10 years ago for Tyndall, possibly, and possibly not even then. Good turnover. Takes a ball under the arm, tries to play into the circle, chasing back. Cover defending from Cunningham as he rolls out and round, but gets robbed. Exeter back in down the baseline, try and take it past Atkins, don't do so. George has been forced back down that right hand side. Exeter tussling, contesting those bottom pockets. Step back into midfield. Finding the space, good overlap down the right-hand side for Georgians. They've got space, extra forcing to track back to the head of their circle, trying to just congest things. Lovely little classic jab tackle from Evans. Evans just knocking the ball away. That's proper old-school tackling that, isn't it? That is old-school, yeah. Bring back the jab. That and the hit. Should we do both of those? Just not enough of that a minute ago. Dan Shingles coming through that right field. Beautiful right to left, proper classic 45-degree hit. None of this slapping stuff. Get your hands through it. Got space out the left hand side, forced to check back. Unfortunately, not able to connect with Archie Winter. I'm talking to Chris earlier on about sometimes when a game is this quick and it does feel pretty quick that you can get into overspeed. How do you then slow it down and compose it a bit more? I think it comes from a few of those experienced players. They say when you sort of realise what's happening with the game. Ball in, lovely turn. On the backhand still getting it across. Sega Gray, Sega Green extended left leg backhand from Carson. Carson was falling away then. Just didn't have the body shape to get the clean connection. Hint to back stick as he went through it. But it's that speed for Georgians at the moment from about 35 metres out into the University of Exeter circle that's causing real problems. Between that, Exeter very, very competitive. That's a lovely old dummy. Lovely and competitive. But that... That speed of outletting on turnover, something that's been really impressive, something that's worked on? Yeah, definitely. We're trying to be direct as possible. That's the thing. When we're, 
not looking to hold the ball as much. It's that direct. Pass. Carson picks up the overhead, tries to get it across Sega Green. Sega Green out does very well. Carson, you could see, he was just trying to pop it up to get it over the top of the sprawling goalkeeper. And that feels a little bit like the difference between the two sides. Whilst it's pretty contested in midfield, whenever X to get it, we don't see the height from their front line that we are seeing from Georgia. So we're seeing Tim Lemmy Carson now on a beautiful lead and pick. Brother Tom also off on that baseline. It feels like they've just got a little bit more confidence and therefore stretch compared to the university. Yeah, definitely. He's trying to open them up, He's trying to open up that, that extra bit of space. And so we need those forwards nice and high to, to do so. Otherwise, you know, it, it's really congested. And uh, this is a great example now where, you know, we play nice and direct. You know, we realise the space is there. Great pass from Carson. He gets ahead and he joins. And Beautiful hands from, from Tyndall. Fabulous. <laughs> and the ball up off the goalkeeper. There's contact on the baseline between Seager Green and Carson. But the hands, the, the delicate nature as, as Tyndall came through that right midfield channel. Exeter really scrambling to cope with it. Lovely carry from Tyndall there. See, that's making up for that half a yard that he might have lost. Talk to him about that sprint, but he's still got the hands, hasn't he? He's still got that lovely carry, as you just seen there. Only Georgian's second penalty corner of the game so far. I think Jackson's come back on after going off for that injury. So, be a change of routine at the top. Still double castle. Tom Carson on the left, Tim Atkins on the right. Not a renowned top flight flicker, Tim Atkins, but provides <laughs> in terms of what he's done over the years. Yeah, I think he's not. He's deceptive. That's that cool sort of uh, sort of niche. He, he does have a, a good slider on him. So, yeah, it, it can cause trouble for those who sort of don't really realise. Is it a power push? I didn't want to say power push, but, yeah, almost a power push. <laughs> And Carson for the first penalty call that the Georgians had. He's still on that left hand castle. Opens the goal up to the goalkeeper's left. The right as you look if you choose to pull it in. It goes across to Tyndall. Tyndall pulls it through and that's a great save on the line. Looked like it was behind Seager Green. So it's Kieran Walton who seemed to take that. Didn't see a clear touch but either the goalkeeper has a great stick on the line. I think it was a great stick on the line. Yeah, that postman's nice and brave there. Good roll back, Tyndall. Just trying to get into the circle as quick as he can. Unfortunately, not five from the university defence. Very, very difficult for them to make the five. Tyndall picked the ball up immediately and drove around the edge of the circle. And as defenders, you're just trying to scramble and get out of the way. But at some point, if you just run into each other, you just simply can't get out of the way. Nothing deliberate about it. No, it is difficult, like I say, that, that five rule. But that's just clever from Tyndall as well. You know, he knows what he's doing there. Um, yeah, lovely, lovely carry once again. Well, Tyndall got the ball away on the slip flick from the last routine. Did very well to be strong enough to get it through the defensive runner. University you know, Exeter seemed to get a little bit of pressure on him, but having got it through that defensive run, it went past Sigurin's left hand and was picked on the line by Walton. Same setup. Double castle out to Carson's castle. He pulls through it. There's the flick we're talking about. If you're on that left-hand castle, it opens up the goalkeeper's left if you can get the slider away. He does so. Beats Seeker Green's left foot and the postman down low. Georgians two. University of Exeter, none. Yeah, lovely flick from Carson there. Such a difficult height as well. I think even, like I say, the postman stayed there. He's nice and brave. Good line. But, you know, that, that height makes it difficult and that's one of the ones that Carson gets a hold of. And, and when he gets a hold of it, you know, it's, it's a really, really good flick. So by our watchers, about 28, 29 minutes gone in this game. Old Georgians double their lead. First goal, that delightful deft tip in from Tyndall after the Atkins pass. The second, as we just saw, Tom Carson from that left-hand attacking castle opening up. Lovely little interchange. One, two for extra drive round the baseline, trying to get into the circle to win something. In the end, Georgian's coming away from it. As Cunningham chases back and denies Sam Patterson any joy. Chindle's a little bit fortunate, still retain possession. Does do so for the free hit, blown for backstick. 
So X2 played well with real pace through this game so far. Had those early couple of penalty corners, but the danger now is any kind of sort of mental fatigue. You've let a couple of goals in, it just takes off that 5% performance, and then all of a sudden this could become a very different game. Yeah, definitely. It's for them, I guess, kind of sort of stick at it almost. You know, they've played well as we've seen with just that circle entry down there, that right hand side. Oh, the whistle gone. Tom Duran stepped in very hard into a space. And, well, I'm a little surprised nothing more came of that. Jackson went for the overhead, saw Carson high up the pitch. Good defensive take. There's the movement. Little touch under the body. Very good turn. Finds the space down the right hand side for Exeter. Taylor looks to slap it in, but forces it through Cunningham. Cunningham stays big, uses his reach. But he's being hunted down in Sanford in that bottom corner. James Farmery trying to help the pressure. Georgians managing just to reset. So we get another roll of substitutions as this half gets close to drawing to a close. Out from the left hand side, Atkins finds Jackson, who's back on the pitch after that knock on his calf. Doesn't seem to have any negative impact on Jackson's movement. No, he seems to be okay. Although just a little twinge there, I think, because he hopped a little bit, but. Well, you talked about being direct, or just wanting to be direct. There seems to be a real um, uh, desire, but also execution. Overhead passes, long overhead passes going over the top of defenders. That seems to be a real de deliberate ploy. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you, we just picked out Ashton Jackson then. When you've got people in those sort of central areas, you can throw those passes almost a bit like a quarterback. You know, they can see that pass and they throw it with such precision and such accuracy that it's such a strength to have. And it's something that, yeah, we try and exploit. Exeter do sort of leave those spaces a little bit higher at the minute for OGs and, and that's what we're trying to create really, that, that overload and the space to play into. Ball into the circle though, back marking, a little bit of space in front of Pinner's goal. George is managing to get some tackles in but that would be a concerning amount of space to give to an opposition <laughs> centre forward in the middle of the circle. I mean there must have been what, two metres off. The University of Exeter coming down that right hand side trying to play the ball around. Tackle coming in from Fleet. Final touch, Georgians one, leading to the extra long corner. This extra just resetting. 2 0 down at this point. They've got that back three, they've got width, they've got angles. Sliding slap, but Jackson reads it like an absolute book. Carson's away. If they can get the ball through, they don't. Carson will look behind him and go, oh, thanks for that, as he sprinted 50 yards to find the ball actually going the other way. Exeter still counter-attacking the game, full of pace at this moment in time. Preferring that right-hand side. Atkins trying to back away, can't do so. And that's an absolute gift of a penalty corner. So do you have to just bail out of that situation? If somebody's running at you and there's nothing you can do, it's literally, where, where, what's the mental process? You're so close, you know that if you foul, you give away the corner, but if you just step away and let them drive through you, then they've got a potential goal scoring chance. Yeah, definitely. I think for their, for me, you've got to step away. I think we know in that 25, if you're within five, it's going to be a corner. And like I say, with a lot of people having such strong corner threats these days, we know that it's a really good opportunity for the, the opposition. So if we do step away there, the, you know, there's always going to be a helping defender or somebody else who's tracking back who can then get pressure to the ball. So, yeah, it, it, it's a difficult decision, but, yeah, for me, I think if we step away there, it's uh, much better for us. I guess the other out negative outcome, if you don't step away, is then the cards, so you're then down a player as well as, as that. Exactly, yeah. So, extra, also double castle routine. Gone to the left-hand defensive castle both times so far. This is their third corner, stays with the same thing. It's not a clean stop. There's a back stick in there as well from the stopper, surely. That popped up off the back of Duncan Scott's stick. He's on the ball now. Goes in, upright, pinner, left hand across. Plays the ball away. Looked like a suspicious back stick to start with. Did a little bit, didn't it? There, yeah, I thought so. But yeah, George is sort of speaking to his defenders there. I think he, he needs a bit more from them there. They're leaving a bit too much space open for Exeter. Lovely little dummy ball through. It's been red. Fleet steps forwards. 
Opponent stepping away so as not to foul. Fleet finds Carson. Lovely one-hand touch. He's looking across. Cuts in field left to right. Tries to slide the slap into the circle. Takes it himself. He's gone the five into the D. Little pop, you'd assume. Yes, along the baseline. And good, strong tackling. Carson with just the one-handed waft. Giving the foul away as the stick contact. outside the Georgian circle go back to that point play they've done that several times looking to try and see Max Lowry to try and distribute they've gone left and firing it in Scott pass there touch in there's a goal in on the tip in Owen Evans Evans getting the ball in Duncan Scott with the hit from that left hand side Georgian is looking a little bit on the back foot it went through Ashley Jackson on the direct line that is exactly what the students needed to close this gap as we just uh, get close to half time. They've had some good chances actually, haven't they really? I think that's, I'd say, it's almost, you know, fair enough for their efforts. They've you know, had some good baseline entries on this right hand side and what it takes is that good delivery, a little bit of a tough one um, to pick it obviously and then a, a very good deflection, controlled it well and uh, yeah, well played to Exeter. Not too fair, it feels like they deserve something for, for their endeavours. I know mean, you don't get anything for support just by deserving it, but they've created enough. Now they have space down the right-hand side yet again. That's a great chasing tackle. Super pick with a bouncing ball from James Albury as he came back on the run from Ben Fox. Next to again, able to get all their players into their opponent's half. Transfer opportunities if they don't get robbed. Contact just stepping through a little bit heavy. Ball forward, little one-handed touch. Sanford having to come forward, also one-handed out to that left-hand side, using his pace and his reach. And really cycling, setting it up for Fleet. We're trying to play through, takes a touch from Exeter. Come on, route one again. Half a touch. And Georgians forcing Exeter all the way back onto their own baseline. Set up for the long corner. Nick Page on the ball, overlapping run. Down that left side out in the reverse, trying to pull it back in. Clever little first time ball, gentle. Looking for the opportunity, it's off Tyndall's foot, but Exeter given the chance to counter. Whilst we've enjoyed the George counter-attacks and getting into the circle, it doesn't feel like they've got consistent clear shooting opportunities onto Steger Green's goal, really. What do you think they need to do to create just that tiny fraction more? And just pause there as Hicks to come into the circle, pulling it back across. There is a touch in, just somehow. How has that not gone in? It looked like it had gone past Pinner. The somehow, circle, pulling it back across. Yeah, the no, no, there is a touch right in, from just. You can see they've had some good success and they're, they're, they're plugging away with it. And they're like, unfortunate, or you know, should they be taking that chance to score? I mean, and that's the sort of chance, particularly at this stage in the half, as, well, as the clock ticks down. That's the sort of thing that you'll look at. And as a forward, you look at that and go, how have they had that not been personally? So does that have any mental impact? But from a team perspective, those sort of chances, that would have evened it up pretty much going into half time. And that's it. Yeah, if that goes in, does it change your half time team talk as well? Does it make it easier for the coaches? Does it not? Well, I asked earlier on during this half whether you pinpoint specific players or whether you just keep doing what you're doing. And whilst we'll talk about Georgians in a minute, for Exeter, they've done well. I mean, staying pretty much as they are, there's a couple of little areas where it feels like they're, they're drawing pressure on them. But they have made them roads down this right-hand side. Yeah, definitely. I think they've obviously stuck to the guns. They've stuck to what they're, they're, they're strong at, and that's playing through those midfield lines. And, yeah, like I said, real fortunate to miss that chance at the end. I think they'll be sort of ruining that a little bit. But no, like I say, they're, they're sticking to what they're, they're knowing and it, it's working. Like I say, is that old Georgians that need to, you know, make a little tweak to how they're pressing or how we're outletting that kind of difference. But it'll be interesting to see how it comes out for that second half. Well, with that, that case, for, for me, the one thing that Georgians have done consistently well, they've thrown those overhead balls and 
Exeter are going to have to make a decision as the time ticks down whether they stay in those aggressive front marking positions that just gives that opportunity to drop it behind or whether they're going to step away to cover that danger but then that opens up the midfield it creates that uncertainty doesn't it it does and that's what we're almost after as OGs you know trying to create that uncertainty it's great to have both options I think that's the thing we've got the high ball but if you know a team drops off and creates a space in midfield then we can open up that space and play through there as well with you know smaller connections well, both sides went at it right from minute one. Very high-paced and intense play. Oh, Georgians took out that 1-0 that and then that 2-0 lead. Pinned back by the University of Exeter to 2-1. To and they'll be ruining that missed chance that somehow went past Pinner's left-hand post that should have seen them going in at 2 all. But it's Georgians with that slight lead. I think we've got some highlights for you from that first half. Well, I think when I first joined, it was straight out of the school, so we're talking many moons ago, probably over 20, probably 21, so. Um, and then kind of took a bit of a sabbatical and came back, and the reason I came back, as I said, I always had uh, kind of the pride, always had that mindset of wanting to come back and give back, because the club did so much for me pre kind of my international career that coming back was the only option. If I stepped away from the top league at the time, that's why I was coming back. It was the only place that I would uh, sort of come back and play. I think it was the new project and you know I'd not, not played for too many clubs in my time and I'd been at Reading for seven years maybe at that point and a few things had changed in my life in terms of kids and family and things like that and I think that it just seemed like a good time having moved here to teach at the school at the college it was a perfect time to really just try a, a, a bit of a new project really and something to, to freshen it up and sort of almost not renew my hunger of the game but just a different thing to try out really and something different to focus on and um, you know, when OGs approached me and sort of mapped out the plan for the club, um, I just thought it was really exciting to be part of something that could really go somewhere. I think there's a, there's a number of reasons. One was my brother was already playing here, so it's quite a natural transition to when I, I was playing out in Belgium to then come back to play in England. It, it was nice to play with him again. Um, but I think probably as important was the ambition of the club. The club have, have real big ambitions to, to not only do well within England, but, but push within Europe. And I had that experience playing abroad, so... 
to hopefully push into Europe with, with OGs was really great. The ambition, just as Tom had said, they, I joined them when they were in conference and you could tell when I joined the players that they had, the players that they brought in, the aim was to be Premier League, top four, challenge for Europe. Um, and that's what I want to do, I want to play in Europe. I was a player back in the day. Um, so I came here when Nicky Thompson was coaching in 2008, eight, nine, and uh, and loved it. It was it was, it was good fun, good club. You could see that they, they, they played hard and they were, uh, yeah, certainly a lot of potential there. Um, I think they went through some ups and downs over that 10 years. Uh, and then when we came back, the chairman asked me to take, to take the job. Um, I declined. I didn't think it was the club was at the right place. But as we chatted and as we kind of went forwards, I realised that, yeah, it was probably the right time to do it. And it was a good challenge for me. So um, always being good people here, always been great family club. Um, and now, yeah, exciting times. When we started to win, we started assembling a, a squad and it was just a really good feel, good vibe, quite an old Georgian feel. Um, the values are massive to, to the club and the people that are involved. And then you just see people have wanted to, to, get, to get involved. So people are coming from the centralised programme, they're coming from other clubs because they can feel something's happening. And I think that's, that's the main thing. But one thing that, that's crucial um, is actually the club ethos. It's a, the club, the first team down to the super vets. People know each other, people talk, people engage. Yes, we're in a funny time, but we still want to know what the result is. Welcome back for the start of this, the second half of this Premier League game at St George's College Weybridge between the University of Exeter and Old Georgians Hockey Club. Half-time score 2-1. Old Georgians took the lead for a Tyndall deflection, then a penalty corner from Tom Carson to get it 2-0. And the University of Exeter came back with a fabulous ball in from Duncan Scott for Owen Evans. Evans to put it inside the far post for 2-1. They then missed a gold opportunity just before the break to take it to 2-2 but Georgian starting this second half here the lovely little movement from Aubrey as he drives down that right hand side I have my third co-pilot of the afternoon to join me we've gone from Chris Griffiths through Andy Bull now delighted to be joined by Lee Morton Tom Carson just reaching now goes one hand around the edge of the circle tries to pull it back finds a chance Seager Green with the left foot save taken down safely by the University of Exeter. That's a lovely little dink into the turf. Once this slows down, Lee, I will introduce you properly, I promise. <laughs> but until somebody puts a stick on it and just takes some of the pace out of it, Fleet looks to go out to the left hand side. So, yes, joined in this second half by Lee Morton. Your second season here. 61 combined caps across Great Britain and Scotland. Pro League appearance in 2019, Commonwealth Games and the Euro. So, a wealth of experience. Why aren't you playing? Um, Good to be here. I think it's been a good game so far. Yeah, not playing at the moment. I've got a slight issue with the hamstring, so you're looking about two weeks out. So probably won't make the game next week as well, but hopefully be, be back for the, the Brooklyn's game after that. I'm delighted that you can offer some, some insight. The guys in the first half also just giving us that little bit of colour and depth as to what's going on. Exeter University breaking one on four at this moment in time. Driving pretty straight at Sanford who takes the ball and then rolls in field. Out onto the forehand. That's a lovely turn. Good vision. Sanford takes it in. Still one hand. A space out on the left hand side for George as they find that space. Sanford still keeps going back up to the top of the D. Carson rolling into the edge of the circle. Finds the foot. What a counter attack from Georgians. And they, it's something they focused on but that's just exceptional. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's a key thing that um, Liam Sanford likes to do. You know, he likes to get the ball, he likes to drive forward, he's a very attacking centre-back, and I think that was key there, because then he got the height 
but then Tom Carson actually had that space for the 1v1 and he's done well just to put it on the foot and they'll be hoping to get another goal like they did in the first half. And sometimes as a, as a player, it's running to not get the ball, so it's running to create space for somebody else. It's kind of a change in mentality for what your average Saturday player would be trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a key part as well now. It's especially at this level, just creating that space for the person on the ball that then gives them one a passing option, but also that option to carry. And I think that was a good example there that probably didn't offer the pass as much, but it gave Tom Carson a 1v1 on the edge of the D. Well, and that 1v1 led to the penalty corners. Georgians with the same setup, no surprise. Two castles at the top. Tom Carson on the left, Shingles stopping right hand castle. Atkins working off a Nick Page stop. Dragged out, left castle again. Carson in, looks to go high. What a, what a take that is. That's the line man who's picked that almost directly above his head. Seeker Green was standing there watching it, waving it, waving it past his left hand. That's two fabulous saves for the University of Exeter on the line. Yeah, it was a great flick there from Tom. That's what I would say. It's going top bends, and like you say, the guy on the line's just been there to back up his goalkeeper. Great stop on the line. University of Exeter now being forced quite deep. Old Jordan is able to get to probably 40 metres out from their opponent's goal. Hackins on the right hand side. Provides an option out, but it's then played across down the baseline. Exeter trying to get the ball away, and it was a steal by Carson. Very close. Exeter going up and over the top. Fleet reading it. Lovely little bit of awareness to step forward. Very easy to, if, you, if you're not involved in the immediate play, just to hold back, and you need your defensive line to be aggressive. Yeah, I think that he initially backtracked and then started to read the flight of the ball and, like you say, he stepped forward to take that and then unlucky not quite getting that connection forward. Now, Tormon on the last defender. Shingles cuts to the left-hand side on his backhand, plays the cross! Now, having seen a couple of things in pre-season, Shingles doesn't score many goals, apparently, but that is a beautiful backhand past Seager Green's extended left foot. Exeter, University of Exeter turned over in midfield, but that's a great finish. Yeah, and as you say, that's not a thing we expect to see from Dan Shingles, but he's had a good few opportunities in uh, pre-season, um, but he's obviously just been saving it up for, for the season to start. That's, that's another one to add to the tally. Well, to give him his due, Shingles has led that pressure through midfield, that midfield press, getting the University of Exeter to just turn possession over. That's time just being pulled forward it was Kieran Walton who stepped forwards with the ball just ran into contact and got turned over allowing Georgians to counter that's a great ball across from a falling Aubrey he's taking a hit on his knee as he's done it as the ball carrier really important that you recognize if you're over carrying so for Exeter they kind of got drawn into having to carry it at that point how difficult is it or how do you affect that just just stop and, and not cause more problems I think for me it probably comes in before he receives the ball um, just that pre-scan realizing is the pressure coming if still then you're probably looking to get that in and then ship it back out but like you say, that's that's probably Dan Shingles' key part of his game. You know, he's really good at pressing the ball, coming in with those shaved tackles. Georgians have missed it. Are they going to get extra do get it? They're deep in the circle. It's coming to the baseline, though. They'll be disappointed. Kieran Patel unable to get that ball back under control. After Samford had missed it, it's a great ball from Ed Carson. Shingles finds a space out on the left-hand side. Played in first time into the back foot. Little looped. Bobbled lift over the defender, stick into the circle. Patel again picks it, cuts in field. Carson chasing back. Contact, play breaks down. I think good skills from Kieran Patel there as well. I played with him at Redden, um, what, two, two, two years ago? I think when he was 17, um, really good hands. So I think, yeah, that's kind of where he wants the ball. Bits off of 1v4, but again, he wants to take that on and, and try and beat the opponent. Oh, you know, six again, he's stolen. Carson knew exactly where that space was. Great move. He'll go far post. It's not a clean hit for Georgians as they go across. Messam trying to get the ball across. Carson had seen the opportunity and gone towards a far post for the tip in, but it wasn't clean contact. <laughs> Dan Shingles picking lines for picking the ball up. 
Unfortunately, in these days, we're not allowed to do that. So, COVID regulations. <laughs> Manager Johnny Steve's coming in to a round of booze as he then similarly picks the ball up. It'll now go and be completely sanitised. <laughs> I'm not sure we got that on camera, but rubbing it under sanitizers like some sort of golden egg. Stanford providing the outlet. Good save from Seager Green. Missed touch defensively. It looks like Exeter just sitting a long, long way back. Yeah, and I think that's very different from the first half. I think the first half they, they actually came out, they pressed, and they were looking pretty strong. I don't know if that third goal's maybe just kind of knocked the sailing out of the wind, or wind out of the sailing. Um, yeah, and I, th I think they're just struggling to kind of regain that composure. I, th I think here's the prime example. They seem to be carrying the ball through dangerous channels. I agree, that third goal has kind of unsettled them a little bit. That, we were talking about just for half time if they just got that second i appreciate you are a whole georgians but looking at it from a just a play by play perspective if they got back on level terms i think it would change the start of this half sanford tries to go under his arm Carson a little bit harrying and hassling either side at that moment really certain as to who the free it was for Patel was looking through Hexton now have got a bit of stretch. Good overhead, they find the baseline. Sanford, that's an all or nothing tackle. Reaching on the reverse, you missed that. That's got corner and card written all over it. Yeah, absolutely. A good tackle, but like you say, if you don't make that, yeah, corner and card, and he's, he's had to time that perfectly and luckily has. But I think Exeter are now starting to keep the ball when they're not driving into situations where they can't win which I think is why they're starting to get a bit, bit more into this, this game here. Whereas at the start, they were kind of taking 1v4s, 1v3s. And again, the success rate there is probably not that great. So they're looking a little bit better now that they're keeping the ball. So is that about still still trying to stretch the play, but when you get it in that 1v4, recognising that you've got the ball high, you can affect the opponent's defence, and then you're playing it back to bring other people into it? Yeah, I would say so. I think when you get the ball, there is space ahead, so carry to it. If you get a 1v1. Good moment there, 1v1, exactly that. Carson just stepping in a little bit too far. Extra on the ball. Patel again looking just to get it reset, being forced back, and that takes the sting out of the counter-attack. Now Extra have the whip out there on the left-hand side, just in front of us, if they choose to use it. But that's forcing themselves backwards. It's that fraction, fine line on a pass between front foot and back foot that can just keep or kill them momentumly. Yeah, definitely. And as I was saying, just before they, they got the 1v1, which they're looking like they're going through again, when they're carrying to space, if they have a 1v1, it's quite a good option to go. But what's tended to be the case in this second half is 1v4s. I think they probably would look to try and bring it back out and then just have a build-up phase of play as opposed to a counter, which is what we've seen for the start of the second half. But they're starting to get a little bit better extra and they're trying to build up a little bit more. Atkins just stepping on the stick of his opponent, Jacob Payton. For anybody who was listening to the first half, we got a bit confused in our timing, so A, I apologise for not absolutely knowing what the rules are. Um, there's no surprise to a lot of people. Um, it's 17 and a half minute quarters because we're not stopping the clock for penalty corners. So having said the first quarter felt long as it clicked through 15 and 16 minutes, no surprise, because it was meant to be 17 and a half anyway. So there we go, we cleared that up. For everybody who's listening, because we're not stopping the clock on corners. Oh, just half a metre or less in front of teammate to create that overlap opportunity. Yeah, I think extra there, if they made that connection, they had a really strong chance of, of getting getting something there. They had a really they had a good number overload, but as you said, just didn't quite get that connection. But when you're in that, that phase and you've got momentum, it's so important that the actual pass is in front of where you're trying to go to because just that putting onto a back foot over just kills any opportunity and at this level with the players the athletes being so quick they can, it can it can just die in a moment yeah i think it's just that weight of pass just being correct 
Albury finds the ball in. That's a great ball in. Seager Green diving gets a touch. We were right down the angle of it. It was going wide anyway. Carson's hit. However, Seager Green wouldn't have known that. And the question will be whether either side can continue to compete physically at the same level that's awful from oh it's got through but that was an awful running hit from Sanford straight down the throat of Exeter University in the middle of the pitch we both had a wince as that ball was played yeah I don't think you want to watch that one again that was a bit too close for comfort Unfortunately, with the level of analysis that Georgians that I know do through the head coach Mike Hughes, I think he's going to be watching it again at some point. I'm also surprised at how quiet Mike Hughes was on the side. I was expecting to hear a sharp, loud voice there. Carson pulls it back round the back, looking for a foot or a pass inside the circle. University you know, extra pin back into that bottom left-hand corner. Albury just creating trouble. That's really well played out. Composed, controlled play from Exeter. Back in, finds the ball down the middle. Is there pace? There is. Eyes up. Pinner coming out. What a pick that is from Stanford on the one on one. Charlie Taylor did not see him coming. He had his eyes up looking at Pinner. Somehow, Stanford's reached in there and just taken the ball off the end of his stick. Yeah, was two points, I think. The Exeter player kind of took his stick off the ball for a brief second that allowed Stanford to get in there. But again, I think that's one of those ones. If he doesn't win that, Maybe looking at a corner on the card, but yeah, that's that's why he's such a good defender. No, it's just that. It's the, you, you're actually right. I agree with you completely. That if you're reaching from there, he was behind the line of his shoulders. He's coming over the top of the ball. So from an attacking perspective, really important to keep your stick right on the ball when you're driving through. Yeah, I would say so. And I think if you know that pressure's coming from behind, you maybe try and cut in front so the defender's got no chance of winning it. Well, the one thing that we haven't picked up on Lee that has changed, just walked past us behind the bench, Duncan Scott is not playing anymore. So having bossed channels in the first half, I thought he was exceptional for the University of Exeter. He's now looks like there's a bit of a limp on there. Doesn't look like he's going to be coming back into it. He's got a track to top on his head guard is off. So that makes a massive difference. Yeah, I, th I think that he's, he's one of the key players, the key ball carriers. Um, like I said, I know him, know his brother, and they're both, both very good on the ball. So I think that, that's the big miss, and that's maybe why Exeter haven't looked as great on the ball this second half. Um, but yeah, big miss, big miss. Duran just turning in midfield, nice little composure, skipping off his toes. Stepping forwards, Tom Carson unable to take that, just suggesting that's gone off his, off his eyebrows. Luke Brown player stepping in front, good defensive lines. Uh, hope we missed that leap. Soft penalty corner, no, no idea. Insight on what that was. Um, I think he's Tom Carson was driving down the baseline. I think he spun. I think it's been given for a foot. That's all I can think of. But again, I think Exeter weren't quite set up to defend that that free hit and they've allowed him into the D very easily. That's one of those moments that you kind of look at it as a commentator as a player, you go, I genuinely have got no idea why that happened. So everybody have your interpretations of, of what that was. Not, the defence didn't object, so you assume that the decision was right, Nick Padgett right on top of it. So, old Georgians, five penalty corners so far. Two fabulous saves off the line. One on the slip flick, one from a straight flick on that left-hand post. The player who made both stops, I think, was Kieran Walton. He's not on the pitch. He's standing beside us on the sideline. So Carson once again on that offensive left-hand castle. Duran on the right-hand castle. 
Carsten yet again picked it up. In he goes through the ball. Left left foot save from Stiga Green. Carsten trying to get his feet around it. Other Carsten, that is. Ed Carson wins the free hit. The defensive intensity being placed on him wasn't fair, and therefore the free hit. The offence given. Corner number seven. Roughly at this level, what sort of corner conversion rate would you be targeting? Um, I think I think at this level you're probably looking at maybe a one in four, maybe a one in three. Um, but again, it, it just depends on on the team you're playing against. Some teams in the league have really good defensive corners. Um, but I, th I think the key thing is if you can hit the target, make them make a save, and like there, it keeps it alive. Oh, corner number seven, left-hand castle, another opportunity for Carson goes down low to the left of foot. That's a great sweep clear like lightning. Max Lowry getting that ball away. Georgian's not happy that it's gone past one of their players. I don't think anybody even blinked. Exeter with numbers. That's a poor pass, though. Georgian's now counter-attack. They've got space. Duran on the right finds Aubrey in the middle. He's got his eyes up, cuts in field. Sees a straight pass out on that left-hand side. There's a pick and a hit and a touch. What a counter-attack goal that is from the top of their own circle is James Carson with the final touch what a fabulous attack inspired step forwards defensively and then what was that four or five passes brilliant yeah I think a very good counter attack and extra actually had a real good opportunity to attack there but James Cunningham stepped in there you know we like to call him Mr Bingus he got the ball there stepped through passed it forward and yeah again Quick pass left, quick pass into deep. Good flat ball from uh, Nick Page and then Jimmy Carson sliding in to put it in there. Really good counter attack. And a killer time to score as the whistle goes to the end of that third quarter. So the scores 4 1 in old Georgian's favour. Tindall scored the first. Carson the second from a penalty corner. Shingles with a rare goal for the third. Carson, Jimmy Carson with that fourth sliding tip in. Exeter with just that one goal, Owen Evans Evans and that miss at half time, they'll be ruining. Georgians now bossing it, but it's the speed of the counter attack, the decisive nature of what they're doing. Both sides still trying to go at it pretty quickly. Yeah, I think the big one it probably comes down to is decision making. You know, Exeter there from the good defensive corner have a chance to counter and they've just tried to force that from the right all the way to the left and it's allowed the uh, OGs to win, to win it back and then count it themselves. You know, they committed numbers forward. That's a hard, hard way to get back. So, yeah, I think it's just came down to decision making there. The bizarre things, if you've got a penalty corner as a defensive unit, just purely numerically, if you, if you manage to not concede, you've then got six on four at the other end of the pitch, but you're kind of getting to that counter attack, counter attack. We talked about it with both the other guys about trying to play too quickly. Was the ball that was played in that we saw up here for Exeter that, that um, James Cunningham stepped in front of. Was it the right ball in terms of intention of where they're trying to get? Or from there, would you be looking for a bit more around the outsides and then coming in later? Yeah, I think it's a tough one. I think the right idea was to come in field because if they went down the right, then it stuck down there. Whereas rather than play that pass, I think maybe they could have driven inside. Then that gives them the left and right options. And rather than it being, what, a 20-yard pass, it, it could be a five or seven-yard pass. Um, so I think the intention was right, but where it had to be done that quickly, like you're saying, is, is another question. So whilst again you have that, that OG's focus, from an Exeter perspective, if you were in their huddle, what would you be expecting to be said? What do you think they need to do more of or less of? I think just take, take care of the ball a bit more. Um, like I said, they, they have opportunities to get forward and they've shown that. It's just been that final pass that's, that's, that's lacked quality. Um, if they can just keep that nice and simple and make it stick to stick, They've got enough players to, to try and get some, some outcomes in the D. Well, they need to certainly create something in the circle pretty soon. They're trailing by four goals to one with just this 17 and a half minutes to go. That third quarter went past like an absolute freight trade. It did. Sanford, the running that he did, created the space for that third goal. Field. Good spin through. Nice little lifted ball movement down that right hand side. Mark Lockery just creating opportunities, but robbed in the end. Exeter taking it back in field slightly. Finding the space for the one handed movement. Tim Atkins trying to shave a tackle, unfortunately failing. Ball into his feet. Reset and transfer. 
X is still the one thing that always concerns me or has concerned me all game is they still have this fairly regimented back four. So they split the full backs better now because they're pushing the half backs higher up the pitch. But when they're almost in a flat lines of four, it feels like it's wasting a player. Yeah, and I also think you notice they might start to have it now, but they're, they're lacking that screen pass just in the centre mid. So, I mean, if they do lose the ball, they're really open to the counter attack. And I think that just draws in another another defender from uh, Old Jordan that then they can try and maybe play around. So yeah, at times they're looking a bit flat, but I also think they're missing that screen pass. So that's that, that the centre midfield is kind of just, just effectively from what we see from the sideline, it feels like they're just running away a little bit. That's a great run forward from, from Fleet. Finds that Tyndall doesn't quite get on it because there was an edge as it came through and lifted it. But yeah, if you've got that big hole in the middle of the pitch, you've essentially got nowhere to go. You've got the, the passes that are then outward to the, to the sidelines and the, the sideline itself creates a barrier for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's one of two things. If there is the space there, then I think as the, the centre-back on the ball, you can carry forward. Well, the call being to come out of that bottom corner. Tindall in the end gets on the ball and forces the free hit. Setting down that right hand side. Atkins just providing the outlet. Shingles now has rolled out of that midfield position into a deeper place, just setting up some angles and some shapes. Stanford able to carry it. Lovely push, slap pass off his right foot on an angle into the top of the circle. Exeter coming forwards, but they've got no stretch. Players sprinting away. They've got it though. They can get a cut in. They've got a player in the middle of the circle if they can get it across. It is across. Pinner out and scrambling. Exeter now with, with numbers, if they can get the ball across the left, they have done. It's an aggressive step forward from Fleet. Ball carried in, little touch outside the D, able to play in, tries to go for the little lift. Shingles, strong and flat, coming out from his penalty spot to affect that. Carson now absolutely on the lead. Is he going to find the lob? He goes one-handed. It's Seager Green in the face, doesn't he? Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, the first one, the second contact just looked like he smashed the goalie in the face. Yeah, I think what a, what a great ball from Tendo, you know, just over the top on the run. It's a tough scale to do. And yeah, I think for, for Tom Carson, to get the first touch on there was was really impressive, big stretch. And the second one, don't know if we go for a swing or he's trying to get a stick on the box on a really good position. But again, yeah, really good counter attack from old Georgians there. I think in, in, for any side, yes, it's effective there for Georges, but if you've got a high player who, as soon as you go through midfield, absolutely puts on the afterburners and just sprints, it creates all sorts of mayhem for the defence. Yeah, it just kind of drags them out, so rather than them defending maybe 20 yards of space, they're doing 30 or 40. Lovely little cut in field on the reverse. Rotation round, unfortunately for Lockie, unable, and then cuts to in on the backhand. Carson takes it down and absolutely spanks it into the goalkeeper. Cat and eye coordination. Lockery a little bit fortunate, possibly the backhand pass across at waist height, not to be blown. Yeah, and I think on hand eye coordination there, the, the Carsons love the cricket, so even you see it a lot with, with Jimmy or even Ed. Anytime there's a bouncing ball, they're, they're there to smash it. I think we're going to find a card there. Yeah, Chingles picking up a card. Just left his foot in to deny X University. That quick break. Tyndall went to ground. Chingles got his stick caught up with Tyndall. But then a bit of a trailing left foot. Cynical but professional. Yeah, I think you can look at that too. He's either really unlucky or it's intentional. So, yeah, the, the green card's acceptable. But, yeah, tough situation because he didn't have his stick because it was tangled. So, I'm not quite sure what to make of that one. Miss touch, <laughs> something you don't want to miss on your back on your backhand going up down the middle. Aubrey again now eyes up, beautiful carry position, finds that long ball to Carson, drops it in field, lovely little interchange with Tyndall. Tyndall rolling round, still hands in and out, left to right, thinks about the first touch, and that's penalised for either the stick contact or deliberately knocking off the baseline. Max Lowry having to get somewhere near it as Tyndall drove through. Are they going to see a card as well? Nick Paget having a conversation with James Tyndall. Could have been asking for a penalty stroke in there, could he? I'm not too sure. I don't think he's really going in on goal. I, I don't think it was much. I think it's a corner. 
But yeah, I wouldn't say a penalty stroke, I wouldn't say a card, but great skills from Tindall there. You know, it's really tough to get the ball and he, he disguises that he's going to go from left to right and he just drops that shield down and then goes on to his reverse stick. Now, certainly not a man you want to be giving a shooting opportunity, a hit shooting opportunity for inside 10 yards because he absolutely mullers it when he gets the chance. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a, a guy that can hit a ball so hard and there was one against Holcomb last year from almost baseline. One castle out to the top, stopped, goes across for the slip. Tyndall tries to get the ball away, goes in his backhand, it's flat, it's hard. Scramble defence from Exeter, 50-50, ball is up. Left hand to Green, does very well, bouncing off his toes. He got back onto his backside in the circle. Oh geez, however, with another real ward corner. Again, I've got to say good defence from Exeter. You know, the OG didn't really execute that well, but again, then Tyndall on the backhand, he's, he's hit that good pace across and you've got that low block in unfortunate that then they've conceded another corner from it. There just wasn't enough on the movement on the transfer as it came from the top of the circle and they've gone to just one castle. It was predictable where the move could come from. Pick up from Duran down the right hand side drives and tries to flip it into shingles. It's cut out on the backhand. Kieran Walton just playing that ball away. More rotations as we get probably halfway through this final quarter. Both sides having started the game so, so quickly. We saw the first rotations after only four minutes. International standard of substitutions at that level. You see between 70 and 80 rotations every single game. The sides today, not seeing that many, but certainly making sure that players are fresh because they want to retain that physical intensity. Lovely little ball inside, finds shingles right on the end of his stick. Extension, one arm, comes into the top of the circle. Can he get more? He does get more! Shingles for home. Goal scoring isn't something to be at the top of his hockey TV. He blasted a reverse just halfway through this game. He's then dribbled in and somehow popped the ball through a crowd of players past Sega Green's right hand. He must have been unsighted with defenders crossing over in front of him. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what we're seeing here. Dan Shingles has got two goals. Um, don't know the last time that's happened, but again, really good skills. He had a strong carry position, and then I think he then just popped that over the defender's stick because he came out, and what, what a finish. Just a little flick into the, into the net. Well, he's got a brace. He has as he's come forward through those channels. A new white ball's come on because the pitch is just staining up the white balls a little bit. Turning them a little bit blue, not making it as clear as the players would possibly like. Sanford looks to step up for the overhead. Doesn't go. Atkins setting up. Slide pass. What a ball that is for Carson. Just trying to come back and post up, but the distance was just a little bit too great. We see it so much and we kind of take it for granted when commentating, but the, the deception that you guys and, and the girls themselves can get on those, is it a hard skill to develop with the deception and the power to play that over 50 yards but in a way that's almost unreadable? Yeah, I think I think it's quite a complex one and I think when I'm, when I'm coaching at school, a lot of the kids ask me, can, can we learn on the disguise sweep? And I think it's a good skill to have in the locker for those instances. Great takedown on the overhead, really super cross field ball. An extra win a corner was messy in the Georgians defence, crossover and lack of communication between I think it was Aubrey and Carson. Didn't get their lines right. Aidy Green, the umpire, just signalling for a stop in time as once again that big bag full of protective equipment is emptied. Next, I really need to get something here. You feel the game's away from them now at 6-1. How to get them back on the scoreboard. As we said right at the start, OGs historically have scored twice as many as they've conceded. Unfortunately, US Exeter are the other way around. They tend to concede twice as many as they score, which belies where they are in the leagues at the moment. Those statistics are absolutely in the league table. They'll be looking... Stand correct, it's 5 1. My notes are incorrect. I've got people with more goals than they've scored, as my producer says in my ears. Anybody's watching that? I wonder who scored the fifth, thanks for that. <laughs> Out to the top, clean stop, long drag, going in for the tip in. <laughs> Disappointing when you are goals down, five goals to one, and then you put it on your opponent, on your teammate's foot. 
assume that's got to be at this OG's ball. While she can, while she can step into that channel, it's got to be a clean pick. Lovely little run forwards. Aubrey just threatening. Great shave tackle. Sticks caught up. So that five-one. Just to recap, Tindall one-nil with a tip in. Carson with his penalty corner. Great goal. Duncan Scott pass in for Owen Evans Evans to go 2 1. Missed chance to go 2 2 half time for Exeter. Shingles for 3 1 on the backhand. Carsten then with a diving deflection. And then Shingles just moments ago running through that right midfield channel and finding that last minute pop over the goalkeeper. Heavy challenge. You feel that Exeter are going to get a free hit and they do. Ed Carsten unable to get back in. Shingles. Going back in Tom Carson, brilliant defence from the forward coming back in, gets his hand down low, finds a clean pass out. Jimmy Carson on the right hand side tries to go inside. Tyndall ran past to create space. Carson just wide of that far post, dead flat. All it needed was a tiny touch from Aubrey inside that far post, and they just stretched their lead. All because a forward chooses to come back, gets flat and controlled in the tackle. Yeah, and as I say, I, th I think with oh. Oh, good save. But yeah, I, I think I think now when you talk about the, the forward getting high, it's not always to, to want the ball. It just allowed that space for, for Jimmy Carson just to, to carry. And I think Aubrey will be a bit disappointed. He couldn't get his stick flat in the ground to tip that in. Good intercept. Superb understanding. One on one as he got wheels. Not enough. Stanford back. That's a nice little reverse. Bunt out to that right hand side. Carry one on one. Stanford still on his toes. Overlapping run. Carson yet again all the way back. Tom Carson doing some fabulous defensive running to intercept the heart of the Georgians defence. Roll back. Good attention from Charlie Taylor. Just not giving Georgians any easy opportunity. Oh, a fabulous burning run from Nick Page into the middle of the circle. Read by Taylor Seager Green. He stepped out. Left foot clearance. Tindall had gone long, Page was trying to do everything he possibly could to get in front of the opponent's goalkeeper. Yeah, I think you spoke about wheels there, obviously looking at that pace to get ahead, and I think that was the difference. Extra breaking through, I don't think their players could keep up, they might be a bit tired, but you had four Jordan's players sprinting back, and ultimately he just got outnumbered, and that, that kind of broke the counter. It was interesting because the one thing you would normally attribute to university teams is exceptional fitness because they are they are can be essentially full-time athletes. Exeter, Durham, Bristol in the past, all in the, the, the top leagues. And I've missed a few. I apologise for those people who are listening, for those that I've missed. But it does mean, as we get a lovely crossfield ball, that we can see that great pass. Tyndall High, he's going to get a bat through it, surely. He does, and that's a brilliant bit of goalkeeping from Seager Green with his left hand because Tyndall had time to swing and took it. I think what was really key for Seager Green there was he came off his line, kind of blocked that angle. I think if he stayed on his line then... <laughs> I don't know where that's hit him, but whatever it's hit, it's hit it hard. If he's got a stick on that, he's absolutely... That's a brilliant bit of goalkeeping, because Carson has smashed that on the backhand. Yeah, he's got some serious power behind that, and I don't know where they saved it with, but as long as he's done his job of keeping the ball out in there, that was an unbelievable save from Se Seager Green. I've got to assume it was stick, because if it had been helmet, he'd have been on his backside with his ears ringing. But it certainly sounded pretty... Uh, it sounded like a stick, didn't it? There wasn't enough rebound for it to be foam. So the chances keep coming for Old Georgians. They're bossing these phases for Exeter. It's few and far between, really, in terms of the ability to get that high possession difference being feels the extra being pinned back and that's a corner unfortunately Sam Patterson looking forlornly at umpire Nick Padgett but his back foot trailing foot was just over that white line you just look at it and realize oh god yeah I think just about a tired defense there you know it's stick moving not quite fully on the ground that allowed um oh the old Jordan's player just kind of drag it into his foot and yeah again I think they'll be looking to try and convert this corner Again, get another one and I think maybe even walk on some routines or I'll just give, give the flickers a little chance to, to get some reps in. Well, Tom Carson is on. Talking of flickers, wanting to give it a bit of a rip. Tom Carson is on that left hand castle. He's got the support of Tyndall outside him on the slip. Atkins on the right hand castle. 
deceptive slider from Atkins, pulling that save out from Taylor Seager Green just moments ago. Next for a little bit delayed, getting their protection on. Setting up three on one defence, blocking the space to Seager Green's left hand side, the right side offensively. Same castle. Tom Carson going across, slides it away, misses the post, harmlessly thuds into the fence. The score line remains the same. Again, I think that's that's one of the key things. If you walk hard, you walk hard to get a shot corner. You got you got to be hitting the target there. That's a let off for the extra defence. And yeah, I, th I think key key things hit the target and keep keep that ball alive in the in the circle. Patel had, had asked for that ball earlier on. It was a little bit of confusion between the two umpires. Both of whom you have to say have umpired very well because we haven't spoken about them at all. And that, whilst that sounds bad, that's exactly what the players want. They want a game that flows. They want nothing to be controversial, contentious. Tyndall tucks that inside, but it's going to come to nothing because that is the final whistle. Four quarters, 17 and a half minutes each have flown by here at St George's College in Weybridge for the Premier League game between Old George and the University of Exeter. Well, it started at a ferocious pace, both sides counter-attacking backwards and forwards. The scoreline was open, Tyndall with a lovely deft little touch for 1-0. A penalty corner goal from Tom Carson for 2. University of Exeter got back on the score sheet with an Owen Evans Evans goal. They missed an opportunity right on the stroke of half-time and then after that it was pretty much all about Old Georgians scoring prowess. Shingles getting a backhand, much to the delight of all of Old Georgians. Carson then with a diving deflection and then Shingles running through for five goals to one. Entertaining game, second half was a world pass league. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think a really good game. I think it extra started the, the half, the first half really well. I, I think that third goal was, was kind of the killer that maybe just dampened their hopes a little bit and, and then from there I think it just became kind of the key the key difference of, of decision making and the counter. Both teams had lots of counter-attack opportunities. I just felt Old Georgians maybe made some smart decisions extra, didn't quite get that final connection and like you say I think uh, uh, Duncan Scott going off was, was a, a key miss for, for ex, uh, extra but overall I think a really good game and I think Old Georgians will take that. It's, it's good for to get a bit of goals, get some goal difference up. And I think for Exeter, I think the key thing here is more, probably not a target game. So try to form as well as you can and, and like you were saying, keep, keep that goal difference as low as possible because I think that might be a key thing come end of the season. We just also saw a shot of Ashley Jackson limping off. With the three of you who've accompanied me today, that's part of an injury list. Obviously, we have Sam Ward not here. If Ashley will also pick up an injury, how deep is the squad here at Georgians? Yeah, it's, it, we've got a really good squad. And I've been working a lot with the, the second eleven, and there's a lot of guys there that, that could step up. We, we saw a few here today that have stepped up. You know, Elliot Messam, James Cunningham, boys that are most likely on most weeks have played twos, but they've stepped in, performed really well today. And I think we didn't see uh, Ashley Jackson in the second half just because he was nursing that. And if it was a tight game, maybe, maybe he might have, but I think when it kind of got a bit more comfortable, he was just resting up, making sure there was nothing nothing major. And that counter-attacking desire, the direct nature of, of what you guys are trying to achieve here, it felt like it changed a little bit in the, in the second half, but as the, as the game kind of went away from you know, Texas, it was probably not quite that intensity. But your, your thoughts on the effectiveness of the, the direct route one passes, the overheads, and the stretch you seem to get in your game for the counters? Yeah, I, th I think the stretch was the key part. I mean, if you can get that, that initial height, then you're, you're always threatening um, to score against the opposition. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's key. It's a lot easier to work and work hard going forward than it is coming back. So if you do the hard yards going forward, you're more likely to get results. Well, this game this afternoon has been entertaining from the very first whistle. It started off with some fabulous pace, both sides standing up toe to toe. We've had some incisive comments from all three of our colour commentators today. We start with Chris Griffiths and Andy Ball joined us for the second quarter and then Lee's been with us for the entire second half. I hope they and you Lee have enjoyed being with us for what will hopefully be the first of many streaming services we do through Galvanized Hockey for the for the English Premier League, uh, both men's and ladies. We'll see how that goes. If you've been listening and you want to put comments through on any of the Galvanized media, social media channels, then please do so. Any feedback you want to give us would be great. But it's a game that started at ferocious pace. Our Georgians got a lead to start with, extra pulled back into it, missed a big chance. And then the second half really was all about Georgians. The highlight, the talking points in the bar were probably the fact that Dan Shingles has managed to score two goals. But we've got a lot of highlights for you. Thank you for your company this afternoon. We hope you've enjoyed it and we hope to be back again soon.